vestiges of what the house had been working on. And right. um, we never really took testimony on those sections about housing, emergency housing, homelessness needs. Uh, and so the committee decided to pull those sections and move them to potentially another piece of legislation, which hopefully we're starting this morning. Um, I assume several of the people on the call have testified in front of House General about this. And David, you were probably there for some of it, having pulled together some of the language um, that gave DCF and ACCD responsibilities to uh, administer, create, implement programs, consolidate, change, uh, whatever. And there was some talk about uh, dollars, uh, which I assume we may get into at some point in terms of making a recommendation to uh, the Appropriations Committee. So um, if you don't mind, maybe you can start off and give us a background of what you heard there and and uh, how the, that committee came to its recommendations. Is that something you could do for us? I, I can do that. It's gonna be a pretty short tale, to be honest with you. Okay, well, let's, um, let's hear that. <laughs> so uh, for the record, you are keeping, my name is David Hall. I am an attorney of the Legislative Council. Um, I have, staff attorney for housing issues and worked on um, a bill which I, I trust I can share my screen at this point with you. I think I've been made a host. Um, so is that working? Yes, it's up. At this point, are you seeing draft 11.1? Yes. I believe we're saying it's it's in the middle of the draft, so we can't see, but I assume it's a lot. Yes. So it would start here at um, section seven. So basically, uh, the way this all came about, the house, sorry, I'm having technical issues. I think it's working now. So the house uh, essentially was, general committee was charged with coming up with proposals uh, related to leave and other benefits, which Damien drafted and then charged with coming up with pieces about housing um, and specifically assistance, which in large part dealt with the inability to pay rent as this crisis continues, but also assistance to homelessness, uh, homeless populations and providers. Um, and then sort of after those pieces, they also came up with essentially some placeholder sections on the moratoria concerning ejectments, foreclosures, and also at the time utility uh, disconnects. Um, so I, I have to tell you that sections seven, eight, and nine as originally constituted were things that I drafted that were very general um, and were initiated in that committee as placeholders for discussion. As you know, the stakeholders in the community of landlords and tenants and uh, also on foreclosure actions worked a significant amount to flesh out what was section nine and what you eventually passed in your draft 3.1 of S333. Um, to be honest, the section seven and eight that are in this draft 11.1, I, I did not hear testimony on those pieces. The number you see in section seven, $5 million was uh, sort of an initial placeholder figure that was batted around. Uh, it stuck, but there was a recognition early on that any amount of money was obviously in, in great flux and they did not devote any significant attention to how much money should be involved the piece in section eight, you'll see section seven uh, speaks to the Department of Children and Families and refers to section eight. And that's because the way section eight was crafted, I essentially went back to the materials that I have collected um, 
concerning the HOP program. Uh, you may remember at the beginning of the session, there was a report and a recommendation from legal aid concerning um, investments on the front end of ejectments to help with tenants who had fallen behind so that they would avoid an ejectment action and they felt that that would be a good investment of money. So based on uh, that research, earlier draft language there, and then on the tail end of this crisis, needing a placeholder for Section 8, um, I made this up. So I, I, I can't pull together a Section 8, which again would essentially charge DCF as the primary authority here because it uh, does administer the housing opportunity uh, grant programs, which provides a lot of the services that are referenced in this section. Um, the scope is a little more expansive. It does direct DCF to coordinate with DHCD, uh, the Housing and Conservation Board and other partners to come up with policies and procedures to administer funding and it's specifically for housing related emergency relief necessitated by the spread of COVID-19. And so the scope of the duties that were contemplated in section eight, um, quite broad, the C housing search and placement, housing stability, case management, landlord tenant mediation, follow up and supportive services to maintain housing, financial assistance for security deposits and rental payments, rental arrears, short term rental assistance, and the purchase or lease of existing housing units for purposes of isolation or quarantine. So these were all these are all things that DCF does, um, but this is specific again to housing uh, necessitated needs uh, made uh, necessary by this this crisis. Um, C contemplates uh, the administration, the development of a process for outreach to community partners, landlords, and tenants developing an expedited application process for emergency relief and criteria for prioritizing emergency funding based on the income, um, projected duration and severity of the need for assistance, other factors. It gives a lot of discretion to DCF. Um, subsection C re would require DCF to maintain adequate records and data concerning funding it provides and make that information available to the General Assembly. And then D, this is the piece and it's, it's short, but I, I don't want to lose the significance. A lot of people uh, in the housing community were, are concerned about the impacts on the homeless population, um, service and housing providers to that population. And so it was uh, an intentional effort to include something about homelessness here. And in subsection D, you'll see that DCF and DACD shall provide information, technical assistance, and necessary guidance to homeless shelters, community housing partners, and landlord and tenant associations concerning the resources and requirements of this act, as well as relevant existing resources. So <clears throat> that was section eight. Um, you'll recall in the course of not only the discussion in house general, but also before this committee, um, the, I think it's fair to say that for the landlord community, um, recognizing that a lot of tenants are gonna have a lot of difficulty making rent, um, staying in housing, but should not be uh, dispossessed, there is a significant need for landlords uh, to have relief, whether it comes through tenants to landlords or directly to landlords. And uh, indeed things have happened at the federal level that uh, would provide some assistance. Um, several of the provisions in the CARES Act do uh, prevent uh, foreclosures as long as the landlord does, agrees not to evict tenants. Um, also, any, any federally uh, insured or guaranteed or directly lended loans through any federal partner or program, FHA, HUD, Fannie, Freddie, et cetera, those all have uh, temporary moratoria, they have the ability to renegotiate terms with lenders. And then additionally, if uh, tenants are receiving sort of a federally supported or guaranteed um, rent, so Section 8 housing or other programs like that, evictions have to are paused on those as well. So um, there are some programmatic temporary protections in place 
and some of the forbearance on, on uh, mortgages would extend to the owners of these multifamily properties, again, as long as they do not evict people during the time of uh, the moratorium and the forbearance. Um, all that said, I think there's there was recognition in the House and there's been recognition in this committee that um, more money will need to flow directly. And so I, I would frame your task as determining uh, how much money should flow to whom it should flow and uh, what of that money could be sourced federally and what uh, will be for, uh, sourced from state sources. That's about all I've got. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I assume other people who, who are um, vested in this uh, area of services um, could describe a little bit more detail of what they're seeing from the federal government in terms of resources and what they can be used for and perhaps what they're seeing in other states as well. Uh, was this language, um, you say you didn't, uh, you weren't there for the testimony, but uh, was this language in some fashion approved by the House General Committee? Um, I, I would not say there was any formal approval of any of the language. I think the recognition was one of procedural timing and process um, that once they took it to the point of draft seven or eight, um, they handed it off to you in, in part to address issues about whether the bill should uh, deal with commercial leases. And then also um, my understanding is that both sides, House and Senate would continue to discuss the money issues. Okay. Uh, Michael, it's Allison. My, my understanding is they had come in our email from Tom is that they were in agreement pretty much with the draft, the last draft we got, which was a of uh, you know, eight or nine point one, as David said. But that they were in pretty, my sense from Tom. I'd have to reread Tom's email, uh, but that they were in agreement. Now the thing that's changed considerably is, of course, we now have the CARES Act and have a very clear notion of what money is available uh, to the state. Uh, uh, well, and not only to federally, but to the state. And uh, so that will be, I'd be curious to understand that. I understand the CDBG money is about 4.7 million to the state. So, I mean, we now know more in terms of what money is available for what pot. Okay. Um, um, and, oh, just, and to that point, David has kindly put up the, all the housing money up on our website uh, under today's testimony, if you click on Tuesday, uh, uh, April 9th. Okay, that would be very helpful. Yeah, it's right so, there. So we're sort of developing something. Uh, we have a little bit of an outline here of where at least the house was going, but we're sort of developing this from scratch. In addition to, to knowing what the resources are at a state or federal level, I, for one, I'm not clear yet, uh, well, it's early, um, as to what people are seeing as the need and what they expect to see as the need. We have certain resources out there, but um, I'm not sure we have heard from people yet as to what they're seeing on the ground or what they expect to see uh, on the ground based upon not only COVID-19, but on past experiences. There's nothing comparable, but obviously experts can project what they expect here. So I'm going to uh, ask Josh to testify next because um, as far as I can tell, he does have uh, a bit of a bridge between what the House had asked us to look at and what we ultimately passed and uh, the reasons we uh, narrowed it somewhat. And uh, he can, from the administration's perspective, as can Ken, uh, say what they can use as help from us uh, and uh, what kind of direction uh, 
they'd like to see. So Josh, if you can hop on, that would be great. Sure, can you, you hear me, Senator? Yep. Yeah, and we can see you. Okay, excellent. Well, good morning. Um, for the record, Josh Hanford. Um, well, I'm glad you're having this discussion. I wish there was a lot more detail. Uh, I'll give you what I know. Um, I think there will definitely be a need for state support um, to fill in the gaps from the federal money. Uh, details are coming out each day. Uh, we know we're getting uh, 4.2 million in CDBG um, COVID response. Uh, Burlington's getting um, the balance of, of the 4.7 number that's thrown out there. Um, they have not given us the date that that will be, we'll be able to submit our plan and use for it yet. In fact, just this morning, I got the letter uh, that goes to the governor saying, here's your allocation, here's your waivers. It's not going to be immediate money um, as, as much as we want it to be. Um, and I'd like to point out that, you know, it's about a little more than 10% of what we got um, after Irene. And the estimated needs from this crisis are 10 to 15 times the amount that we need from Irene. So um, I know there's more CDBG COVID response money coming uh, based on formulas that will be known in 45 days, they say. Um, there was $5 billion in total awarded. Our 4.7 that Ramon is getting um, is only the first $2 billion of that. The other is coming out in various formulas and, and as time goes on. Um, so we will get likely a little bit more, but I still think there's going to be gaps. And frankly, you know, what CDBG money could use, be used for, um, it, it puts some limits. You know, you have to go through communities, first off, um, you know, that it doesn't waive that requirement where a municipality is the only applicant for CDBG funds. They can pass it on to someone else but that's sort of a, a timing and logistic um, hurdle of these funds that we have to work through. Um, and the ability to use CDBG funds for direct rental assistance is, is un, unclear um, at this point. I know the uh, advocacy organizations, our national liaison group, have all asked for a waiver of that. Um, CDBG um, normally is prevented from being used as rental assistance. It's meant for, you know, building homes and um, uh, revitalizing um, downtowns and, and doing infrastructure projects and supporting business expansion. It's rarely given out for uh, direct sort of rental assistance. 80% uh, of HUD's budget is in the form of rental assistance um, through the Section 8 program and others. And they've, you know, specifically restricted CDBG from that purpose because so much of the HUD budget goes for rental assistance. So Josh, may I ask you a question here? Yep. Uh, there is uh, identified 1.25 billion uh, for tenant-based rental assistance, independent yes. of this. Uh, uh, and do you know yet how much uh, Vermont is getting of that? Um, that would be a question for Richard Williams, who I believe is on oh, the, the list later on. I know just a few days ago, he did not have the details yet, um, was hoping for some more info from HUD yesterday. Um, but, you know, we've certainly talked about how that rental assistance, they're going to get something, an increase could be used to support, um, you know, the situation out there where, um, you know, a lot of property, a lot of uh, landlords are not getting rent right now and how we could use these funds to put money in the hands of tenants so they can they can pay their rent. It's certainly part of the puzzle here. Um, but I, I don't have the details and, and not clear how that puzzle is, is, is uh, put together at this point. Um, but I am very concerned about the impact of the non-payment of rent on the rental housing industry, the whole industry, um, private, nonprofit, public housing, um, I think there are some protections um, that certainly David Hall mentioned about program um, properties in Vermont that are assisted with certain federal um, backed uh, mortgages and guarantees and whatnot. It's not very clear how extensive that is in Vermont. Um, 
it, from the, the discussions I've had, and you have a few other folks on the call that, that know more about this as well, but um, some of those programs are not widely used in Vermont. Um, so it's, it's unclear how much uh, protection that's really going to provide us. Um, but I'm really concerned about folks that are already on the edge, um, you know, being able to maintain decent, safe, you know, housing, rental housing, how, you know, months of non-payment is going to uh, affect that and all of the, the things that comes with, that come with that. You know, if you're not getting rent, how are you able to pay the furnace guy and fix the leak in the roof? And it just goes on and on. So one of the areas that um, I'm certainly advocating for um, is a sort of housing stimulus in whatever legislative package uh, comes through. You know, um, you know, I, I'm sort of thinking of it as a housing relief fund um, where there's some sort of 0% um, deferred or forgivable loans um, that can be uh, provided to property owners suffering from non-payment of rent due to COVID-19. Maybe the loans are forgiven if the property is participates in some sort of rehousing program for vulnerable populations. You know, and that's where we, maybe we can mix some of the rental assistance, try to deal with some of the um, uh, massive transformation that's going on with the homeless population and the shelters and maybe we could keep some folks from returning to homeless shelters and actually house them um, permanently. So there, there may be some sort of transformational change that comes out of this um, if we can, can get this puzzle um, right, that it, it could have some lasting change that's actually good. But uh, so the administration um, leadership is talking about um, putting together a legislative package as we speak. Um, you know, part of the challenge here is understanding where this federal funding is going to fill the gaps and then what we can come in afterwards and, and plug the holes, serve the, the folks that are sort of left out, that are harder to serve, that are maybe, um, you know, missing from the federal response. And I, I don't have the, those answers right now, but I do think that there is some sort of need for um, a, a program that puts, uh, you know, loan money, forgivable loan money, um, deferred certainly um, till times are better in the hands of property owners. Um, you know, folks that own rental property that aren't getting other assistance. It, it, the, the tenants are also gonna need rental assistance, but um, uh, months of non-payment in a large fashion is going to um, have a, a devastating impact. Um, and many of these properties might not qualify for some of the SBA and other loans that are out there right now, they don't have large payroll, they don't have a large staff. Um, they have, you know, sort of capital intensive businesses, meaning they need to maintain, you know, safe and decent housing for folks to live in. They don't have a ton of staff. Um, they may be set up um, as certain sort of corporations that don't qualify for some of the SBA stuff. So we'll have to see, but I think there is a, a role for, for the state to provide some funding here in a creative way um, and put it in the hands of, of folks that provide housing for, for Vermonters. Okay, thank you, Josh. Is there, a, is your, I haven't been able to pull up yet. I think I will get there. Um, your handout, does that sort of identify all the various federal funding sources in the stimulus package? I think I looked at, um, so this this comes, I'm not sure where this came from, but I quickly looked at it, um, CARES Act housing and bond market discussion. That identifies yep, what I'm aware of for, for housing. I don't see, uh, that's what I expected to see in there. I've seen various summaries from Senator Leahy's staff, other sort of liaison um, groups in DC. And, and this is what, th these are the buckets of money I have seen. So it's at Michael. It's it's on our our web page under today's date. No, I, yeah, I know where it is. I'm just trying to oh. get oh, I'm sorry. get there without um, without losing the Zoom. So I, don't I think it's from the it. treasurer's office, uh, Vermont State Treasurer's office, put this together, and it's it's what I uh, I've seen. It's in good, and it, it, okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael, may I ask Josh a question? Please do. 
So, um, Josh, I have some concern, uh, all of us do, uh, about how this interplays with the current uh, building things that are on scheduled for construction that are also new ha additional housing. Um, so I know your CDBG meeting got rescheduled till June, and I'm a little concerned. I know I know we have three big projects that have gotten uh, VHFA uh, um, credits, uh, nine percent, and. I'm just concerned about what's happening to the three big projects in Rutland, Bellows Falls, and, and Hartford, uh, where th they're ready to go. They, they would have been being discussed in the April meeting, now put off to June. Can, they, can we expect that that funding that already, should already be there is ready to go and that those projects will be able to be in construction on schedule? Um. There's a lot to that question that, that, that I can't answer. But what I do know is even if we had the April board meeting, there was more requests for those four projects you mentioned than the entire pot of CDBG money available. So I'm not sure that all of them would have moved after the April meeting anyways. Many of them would have had to come back to June. Right. Um, so we have existing CDBG dollars that we will be giving out in June. It'll be a larger pot because it'll essentially be two, two, two board meetings combined. Um, that's June 3rd, I think, or June 11th. I can't remember. June 2nd, I think, or 11th. Yeah. Um, and what I don't know is if they will be impact, even if they've received funding at that point, the delays that everyone's having to experience right now may create a backlog. You know, I hear we get requests daily from contractors, construction companies, they're saying, you know, if we don't get this order lifted by April 30th, we're on to a new job somewhere else. You know, our, our right. workforce will essentially leave and take a construction job somewhere else because they have to. I no, this is, a, that. this is a big um, issue. <laughs> it's a big issue, you know, trying to keep people safe. safe. I'm looking at three emails this morning, uh, very, specific cases around this. There are folks that are, you know, uh, call them full-time RVers that are due back in Vermont this week to their RV. This is where they live from April through October and they don't, they can't get an okay to move in. You know, their housing in another part of the country is ended. They're supposed to be here. The RV parks aren't being allowed to open up unless they're serving um, emergency relief, you know, COVID relief for housing workers or vulnerable populations. So all these specific requests and, and waivers, you know, people's homes that were supposed to be finished this month that are supposed to be moving in, those jobs have all put on, on hold. So it is a major disruption to the whole housing industry um, that we have to unwind this. Um, we have to unwind it carefully and as soon as possible um, but I don't have that date, um, you know. Right. And, and of course, it's a bit of a catch-22 because we need the housing finished to move people into and to have that transform transformational impact you're talking about in terms of the homeless. All of these projects deal with homeless plus low income plus moderate. So yep. <laughs> I know it's really a challenge. Oh, man. So uh, you made mention, uh, Josh, of the fact that the administration may have a proposal on all of this or some of this. And um, is there a, a working group of some sort that is meeting uh, regularly or irregularly to, to start putting ideas down on paper? I know you're, a lot, you're in the same situation as the legislature in terms of waiting on some guidelines and directions and allocations from the federal government, but uh, what's, what's, what's going on in-house uh, in terms of who the players are and what's, what's, how close you are to putting something together? Mm -hmm. There are, there's been uh, several task force formed um, with uh, different leadership and then some outside sort of um, uh, 
uh, you know, folks in the field and it, it, from businesses and from industry that's relevant to the sort of sector to sort of give some guidance. Those have just been formed. I, I don't have a detail across, because this is across all sectors. You know, everyone is feeling that they need, um, uh, uh, you know, support, relief, some package from the legislature. Um, you know, I know the governor's talking to, to the leadership a couple times a week. We're having briefings with the governor twice a week from the economic mitigation and recovery leadership team is what it's called. And under that, there's uh, three task forces formed um, that are sort of uh, gathering data right now and dealing with, you know, immediate, short-term, mid-term, and then long-term sort of recovery needs. And the legislative package is sort of in the midterm. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not actual response to the crisis today. You know, these are funds that are gonna come in and, and we'll be able to use for more of the recovery. The sort of response crisis money is, is you know, it's being spent and we're requesting, you know, FEMA presidential disaster relief and, and those things have all been approved. I, I don't have details, maybe after t my today's um, leadership team on this, I'll have a little bit more of the, the broad schedule I just know that my um, comments and, and um, contribution to the needs from the housing community, um, I, I've already started to sort of um, put together th this, this idea of a, a recovery, housing recovery fund. Um, and when I get some more details about what um, our, our total sort of ask is going to be, um, I can start giving some more details and then also be coordinating with some of the other industry folks that are on the, um, you know, on your witness list today um, for their feedback. And then of course we have to design how we use it and come up with all those parameters. Um, but I would say that the, the, uh, the original $5 million and the sort of outlined uses um, that the you know, House General had is, is a good starting point for all of us to consider. I don't think that that should be thrown out. Okay. So, all right. Uh, the, the list, saying, oh, go ahead. So I'm, I'm just, when you say it shouldn't be thrown out, are you suggesting that that would be a good starting point for a new housing stimulus bill? Or are you suggesting that it would be an amendment that we should add this back in as an amendment to our bill. I, I'm just saying the um, development of that, um, I, I wasn't really involved in that and I didn't um, testify at all in House General and I'm not sure if, if Commissioner Schatz did or others. Um, you know, I think um, what David put together there is, is, is some, good, some good stuff that we should build on. I'm not sure if it's exactly the right number, if it's exactly the, all of the right um, areas, you know, a lot of it um, uh, favors heavily towards sort of the direct rental assistance for tenants. And I, I think a missing component is some sort of deferred loan, forgivable loan to uh, actual property owners that are struggling. Um, you know, if they can't reopen their housing or address, you know, life safety needs, um, you know, rent that's going to come in next month is not going to help them get people in there. Um, you, you know what I mean? So that, that might be a, po a place that we need to focus on and the administration needs to come with a proposal to add to that list is kind of what I'm saying. Right. And I, I think they had weighed in on that list. The Angela and the Landlords Association had been a p part of this. I, I believe everyone had supported this. And I think the landlords were viewing, well, I mean, they could speak for themselves, but the tenant assistance, I mean, at least then rent was getting paid in some capacity if there was assistance for, for renters. Right. So, so I, sorry, I, I don't have more to add at this time, but um, I, I think there will, there is a need. And I think that um, we will be able to um, provide our, our thoughts from the administration on a housing component to uh, the sort of uh, relief that the legislature, you know, it, it is working on. So is it possible, I don't know if you're the right person to ask, but I'm looking at Beth's handout now from, it's on our webpage. 
and I see some breakout in terms of the overall amount of money nationwide. I'm not sure I see a breakout as to what uh, in one place anyhow what, what Vermont is likely to receive and what strings are attached to any of their pots of money. Uh, for instance, uh, I would assume that the CDBG block grant, this would be added money that you would administer in the same way as, um, well, maybe not, maybe you have to segregate that money for impacts caused by COVID-19. But I guess, we'll, I guess as help for the committee that we can have in our files is if we had all these sources of money broken out by how much the state's going to receive and what parameters those monies can be used, either restrictions or flexibility uh, to start getting a, a, a better picture. And maybe some of our later witnesses who are in these areas have looked at that uh, to see what's available. I mean, I think the, the big wild card, especially if housing rises sort of to the top of some of the needs for our state is the, um, the, the 1.25 billion that Vermont's gonna get uh, that's discretionary money. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not necessarily limited to these six bullets or seven bullets here. There's a whole very large amount of money that everybody's going to be looking towards to you know, backfill the state shortages, uh, but also could be used for you know, housing. Exactly. That, that $1.25 billion that's coming to the state for a variety of uses, um, everyone's going to be looking for that money to, 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 um, you know, to access, like you said. I don't know if backfill is allowed, but to keep operations moving forward from every sector, AHS, education, you, know, you name it. What, what I can tell you is on this list, the different breakouts of what Vermont is getting that we know of to date it, it is if you scroll through, you'll see the bold under each yeah. section. Those right. are the only items we know Vermont share. Many of these other areas, the, the formulas haven't been written or, or run yet to say what Vermont's getting. Um, and, I, and the CDBG money, to, to answer your question, the uh, 4.5, Two that the state is getting and the 450,000 that Burlington is getting. Yes, it's for COVID related items only. Um, the one flexibility it gives us is um, we can use for public services. Typically there's a cap. We can only use up to 15% of our CDBG money in any given year for what's deemed public services sort of expenses. So that's a good flexibility for these funds. Think of operations for a food shelf. We can use our money to pay, you know, staff, volunteers, and operations of a of a local food bank or food shelf. Where in the past, that public that's a public service. We could only use fifteen percent. Um, we normally get about seven million dollars a year in regular CDBG funds, and for this year coming up, that's that's roughly our allocation as well. In addition to about seven hundred fifty thousand, we're getting from uh, for recovery housing, you know, opioid uh, recovery. Um, it, this was a new, this was going to be the big new thing this year before this crisis hit that we had a special pot of money um, to, to work on, uh, to, to just address recovery housing needs. Um, so good news is this year is going to be all said and done. Um, one of the largest years of, of CDBG funding into the state since Irene. Um, but I still think it's it's gonna it's not gonna address all the needs out there, and there are going to be areas where um, more flexibility, state general fund to address housing needs um, would be, will be needed. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the things that I think we've learned from our appropriations committee and it makes all the sense in the world is that 
pot of 1.25 billion um, is, uh, as we've said, is going to be sought after by a lot of people. Uh, so, to the extent we can find some other funding, either in in uh, these dedicated sources or elsewhere, uh, I think it's going to be for housing. I think it's going to be viewed very favorably by the appropriators um, as we move forward. So we've got to like, you know, turn over every rock here to find potential money for housing. Okay, let's, uh, if anybody has any more questions of Josh, uh, appreciate all that. Uh, and I'd like to move on to uh, Ken. Um, should I get back on my screen here? Okay. Good morning. Ken, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I hope all of you are too. I'm uh, Ken Schatz, the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I do want to start by appreciating you taking the time to look at these issues. Um, obviously, we're all uh, struggling to address the issues raised by COVID-19. The homeless population is of particular interest and concern because they're so vulnerable. Um, we, as you know, have been doing a tremendous amount of work trying to support that population. Um, and like other things that we're dealing with, whether it's child care, our substitute care system for children in custody, with respect to the uh, population that's homeless, we're trying to address the immediate needs presented by the pandemic, but also try to maintain a stable system of care so that we're ready to continue providing support as we come out of this crisis. And, and frankly, that's challenging in every sphere, including this situation with respect um, to support for people who are homeless. So again, I appreciate the approach you're taking here. Um, as you may know, we're, we're, um, we have totally uh, waived any uh, restrictive rules regarding emergency housing. So we are putting up a, a substantial number of people in motels. I get daily reports. We have approximately 1,400 people in motels today. That obviously is a pressure and a challenge in numerous ways. Many of our homeless shelters um, are also doing their best to support people in their communities. Some of them have had to close, whether that's because of the nature of their facility and they could not abide by the health department guidances regarding social distancing, or for that matter, staff have not been able to uh, work because of issues affecting them on an individual basis. So it has been an ongoing challenge. As you know, the state is working hard to set up recovery and isolation facilities to address the needs of people who are symptomatic or ha are COVID-19 positive. Um, Harbor Place, a facility in Burlington that you are probably quite familiar with, has been identified as an isolation facility. Goddard College campus has been identified amongst others as potential recovery sites. So a lot of that is going on. As um, Josh mentioned, we are working to look at the sources of federal funding to see uh, what we have available and how we have to use them. We have to be careful to abide by federal rules. And so that work is ongoing. So. I certainly appreciate um, the, uh, the, the proposal to appropriate money in this bill. I'm not at a place where I can tell you a number either in terms of what exactly we need. Although as Josh indicated, clearly the effort is being made to provide some sort of supplemental appropriation request to the legislature generally, and it will include housing issues. I will say that the, as others have mentioned, the CARES Act certainly um, does have some uh, resources that will be very helpful. And in that vein, um, we also uh, did get notice that we will receive some money from HUD for the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. That is one of the pots of money that we typically use, as David mentioned, in our HOP program, Housing Opportunity Program. And so we have actually, as of Tuesday, issued a supplemental um, grant application opportunity uh, to uh, enable providers to 
give us applications with respect to meeting the needs of the homeless population in light of COVID-19. So we're working on that. Again, as David said, the uh, HOP program and OEO in particular does this kind of work on a day-to-day -day basis and so is well suited to administer any supplemental grant program that is eventually approved. I will put in uh, certainly a plug for our staff. I think we have a great team with great leadership with Sarah Phillips as um, the administrative director of OEO. We do our best to work with all stakeholders and partners on an ongoing basis. I will share though that if we're asked to do a substantially uh, supplemental program, I'd love for the legislation to be clear that we can add some staff to enable us to manage that appropriately and successful. <laughs> Senator Clark, I'm glad you appreciate it. I can't be a good bureaucrat and not at least make the point that we uh, this does require work and uh, we need people to do it because we want to do it well. And I think that is, is the reason I mentioned that. Um, and so looking at um, the, the specifics, um, one of the things that I'm not sure is there is whether or not this legislation or this money would be contemplated to support the emergency housing need that we have. I'm certainly totally on board with all of the uh, ideas listed in, in section uh, eight with respect to supporting um, tenants and uh, addressing the needs of landlords in terms of enabling people to stay in place. But as I mentioned, emergency housing is clearly one of the substantial expenses that we are undertaking and committing right now. So again, that, and obviously the advantage of a, a, a general fund appropriation is that's the most flexible money, um, as opposed to federal money, which has uh, substantial restrictions. So in the context of uh, continuing to suggest that you think broadly as you look at this legislation um, in partnership with appropriations. So let me sort of stop there because I want, wasn't sure exactly what you're looking for from me and glad to do my best to answer questions. So Ken, um, you mentioned 1400 people being in hotels. Uh, what is the, is there a, a count as to the number of people that are considered homeless right now in the state of Vermont? I don't know that the others may be better than me. I don't know that there is any particularly uh, definitive way to identify that. Um, I see Earhart's on the, on, on the panel here. Uh, there is the point in time study that is done, but again, the, the results of that vary whether or not it's an, a, an all weather conditions night. And so it's really challenging uh, to identify the number of homeless people um, in our community at any one time, much less over time. And when you mention homeless shelters and being able to follow separation guidelines, um, does that, um, I mean, are shelters functioning given that they're congregate settings right now? Or I've heard talk about trying to move people out of shelters into individual units? That's right. So some of that is definitely going on. I think there are some shelters that are still continuing to operate, albeit with smaller numbers of people in there to maintain the separation that's necessary. But by way of example, um, a new place, a shelter in Burlington, decided to close because they could not uh, abide by those guidelines. So instead, and this was really a tremendous effort of stakeholders all coming together, um, basically with the city of Burlington and lots of uh, CVO activity and others, we put together uh, a an approach to immediately bring trailers to uh, North Beach in Burlington to provide shelter for homeless people who had otherwise been in that shelter in Burlington. One example, there's others around the state. We are part of the reason for so many people in motels is that with respect to the uh, decrease in, in numbers of people in shelters, we've moved them into motels. And some of our homeless providers are actually helping to support and manage those efforts too. I wanna to point that out in appreciation uh, for people coming together to try to address this situation. Are there any numbers on uh homeless folks that um, have been tested positive with COVID-19? 
That um, it is, it's very small. Uh, literally yesterday, my understanding was three, but that is, um, again, one of those things that uh, it depends on the communication. But right now, um, the number, the good news is that number is actually very small. But again, we expect it to grow as, as we uh, hear from the health department that we're still moving towards uh, peak in terms of spread of the virus. Uh, Ken, Ken, may I ask, do you, uh, a number of our communities have places that conceivably could be recovery sites. Are you getting people funneling those kind of, like, for example, we have a, in Hartford, uh, there's a closed down nursing home called Brookside. It's completely vacant. Uh, it, it could, I mean, are people funneling that stuff to you? Yes, so I, I'm, I am noting that, uh, that that particular place to make sure I follow up with that. But the, um, as you may know, the State um, uh, Emergency Operations Center has a human services branch that is looking at uh, sites and is getting information. And obviously there's a variety of needs. As I mentioned, there's um, the need for isolation for people who have symptoms. Right. There's recovery centers. There's also um, surge capacity with respect to medical and healthcare needs. So yes, right. a lot of that information um, is being gathered and people looking at appropriate sites. And, and if we have ideas like the Brookside Nursing Home, which is vacant at the moment, uh, it, who should we send them to? Um, I would, I'll uh, volunteer Jenny Samuelson from DIVA who is leading the human services branch of the SCOC. Samuelson? Yes. I could send you okay. her email address. That, that would be great. And I'll send her the Brookside nursing home name or you can give it to her now. Yep. I will do that. Great. Michael, um, can I ask a question, Michael? Absolutely. Uh, Ken, are the people that you're putting in hotels being tested? Uh, so we have not generally. The, the guidance from the health department is still to have the decisions related to testing made by the uh, primary uh, care physician. So we do have better capacity, as I understand it, to do testing. That's certainly growing, but it is still based on whether or not um, there are symptoms that warrant testing. Ken, okay. did you... Uh testify on the, this language in the House General Committee at all? Very generally and briefly. Um, it sounds like uh, a significant portion of DCF's work in the housing area deals with the homeless. Is that a wrong assumption on my part? No, it's right. So we have the, through the general assistance program and OEO, we do a lot of work with respect to emergency housing for the homeless, particularly through the HOP grant process, which is through OEO, part of DCF. We certainly address more of the kind of preventative kind of approaches and stability kind of approaches that are described here. So that is part of our work also. In addition, OEO uh, manages the family supportive housing program which is an approach to provide case management with families to enable them to move into stable permanent housing. So we, we're not the entity that creates new housing to be sure, but we do provide the support for homeless and case management approaches uh, with respect to people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. So I'm trying to... Um, uh, not rectify, I'm trying to understand, I guess, in terms of the language I saw, uh, it seemed like you were gonna be the lead agency on all of this and in conjunction with other partners, uh, but it seemed like the list of things were not necessarily uh, exclusively dedicated to homeless issues or emergency housing issues. And um, I didn't know if you had volunteered to do that uh, <laughs> or um, it was just in general putting players together, but you always appeared first on the list. 
I think it's fair to say we were voluntold. No, I, I actually think, as David <laughs> indicated, um, uh, this this list is actually quite consistent with the approaches taken under our existing housing opportunities program. So again, I'm. It's not as if I mind if someone else wants to step forward or is a better. Uh, manager for this type of approach, but I do actually think and appreciate uh, that we might be the right ones to do so because of the existing HOP program. Okay, so I, I guess I'm narrowing in on the fact that it seems like what the House may have been focused on was homelessness and uh, emergency housing for people who may be displaced. Um, and not necessarily a more general approach that would sweep in uh, perhaps um, uh, a lot of our other housing programs that are a lot of our other witnesses are um, in charge of or work with on a daily basis. Uh, I just wanted to get that picture a little clearer. Um, okay, does anybody have any questions for uh, Ken, anything else you want to add, Ken? No, again, I appreciate the work. I will need to sign off now to move on to another meeting, but I'm glad to stay in touch and answer any further questions uh, that you have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ken, for your work. You're welcome. Thank you all, too. Bye now. We're all so grateful. Allison, do you have the witness list in front of you there? I do. Who, who is next up? Uh, Erhard, Erhard and Dick Williams. Erhard, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? And thank you. Um, hanging in there. Okay. Hope you all are well as well. I know we're all in the same situation, staying safe at home. It's getting kind of old, but um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to speak. Uh, just before I get going, just to your line of questioning, Senator Sorotkin, uh, on the, the uh, draft bill sections uh, seven and eight that came over to you from the House, um, just bear in mind, those were uh, sections, and, and I thought David Hall did an incredible job under the circumstances. They were written on March 12th and 13th, and so the focus, um, and we worked with House General, as did uh, several other folks uh, on uh, that list, it was all focused on sort of what what were the immediate crisis emergency needs from the perspective of, of March 12th and, and 13th. And obviously, we've learned a lot since then. Um, and uh, we still have a long ways to go in terms of learning um, what is uh, going to be available through the federal through the federal government. Um, but I, I just also wanted to thank your, you and your committee for all the incredible work that uh, you did uh, in, in conjunction with House General on the eviction and foreclosure moratorium, which was one of our highest priorities when we were kind of looking at the impending crisis uh, back in, on March 12th and, and 13th. And I'm, I'm glad that that's uh, nearing. Uh, ho hopefully we'll get across the finish line um, soon. And I think as, as someone pointed out early on, um, the, uh, one of the understandings and one of the reasons there was um, such an unprecedented agreement around uh, something that might normally be incredibly controversial, uh, like uh, an eviction moratorium, um, was the understanding that there would be uh, assistance um, at some point, whether through the federal government or the state government or some combination of the two, uh, to make sure that um, renters uh, were actually able uh, to uh, to pay pay the rent, um, and uh, that uh, property owners um, would be able to, in turn, pay pay their bills. Um, and you know that uh, obviously, I think one of the things that bears mentioning uh, as you continue to work that bill through the process is that. Um, um, folks have an obligation to pay rent, uh, and we uh, need to make sure that that is part of the messaging that uh, goes comes along with uh, with the bill. Um, and and that said, um, you know there clearly with the job losses that we're seeing, uh, even in spite of the enhanced uh, unemployment insurance benefits that um, we're getting through the federal government. Um, I, I think there's still going to be uh, significant uh, potential for income loss as a result of uh, 
cut back work hours or job losses um, and a resultant uh, challenges with uh, with folks being able to pay the rent. So um, I, I think the, the bill um, that came to those sections seven and eight that came to you from House General uh, are, as Josh and others uh, have said, a good starting point. Um, but we've come a long ways in um, the three to four weeks um, since uh, the legislature adjourned in terms of learning. Um, and I think it, it, it can be uh, significantly um, enhanced. Uh, I also will point out that the five million dollars was it, it was a placeholder um, completely um, just to get something uh, in there uh, that um, um, to get a number in there and to make sure that it was understood that there would be um, a, a, a need for uh, for a supplemental appropriation to deal with uh, a housing and homelessness emergency response. Um, I I also want to point out and I it's it's uh, I, I uh, just want to make sure that folks uh, are uh, aware, you know, we've talked uh, uh, for many years now uh, that housing equals uh, um, equals healthcare, and that healthcare and, and housing are, are integrally uh, intertwined. And I just don't want to miss the opportunity uh, to point out that, you know, one of the things that I think we've just universally learned through the pandemic and the need for people to, um, to, to be safe uh, at, uh, at home um, is that secure, safe and affordable housing is absolutely essential uh, to, uh, to health and is an integral part of, uh, of, of health care. And I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to kind of step back and, and, and make that um, observation. Um, I'll also say that, you know, over the last um, three weeks, and, you know, huge um, kudos to uh, Ken Schatz, to Sarah Phillips, uh, to their entire team, uh, to, uh, to Josh, really to all of the um, folks in the agencies that are that are supporting the folks out in the field, uh, our, our members, um, whether they be nonprofit housing providers or homeless service providers and shelters are really um, at the front lines uh, of this. And there are a lot of concerns um, that have that have come up over uh, the last few weeks. And uh, I, I would say the first couple of weeks were, uh, you know, just incredibly uh, hectic as uh, people were moved out of shelter, as Ken pointed out, um, some shelters, for instance, in, in central Vermont, uh, the two warming shelters, the seasonal warming warming shelters, one in Montpelier, one in Barrie, and then the permanent shelter in, in Barrie, uh, their entire census, their entire population uh, was moved into uh, was moved into a motel um, because it was uh, pretty early on recognized that they were not going to be able to um, keep any uh, any kind of social distancing uh, in those situations. And as Ken pointed out, um, our homeless service providers um, in conjunction with community support networks um, in each of the different regions are uh, continuing to support folks uh, that have been moved into, into motels. Um, one of the things that DCF and um, OEL wisely did early on was to identify a new class of folks uh, that they identified as hyper uh, vulnerable due to the, uh, uh, the pandemic and immediately moved those folks out of shelter uh, into, into motels. Um, and so the network is, as you can well imagine, incredibly stretched. Uh, the homeless service provider network, um, whether they're supporting folks with potentially decreased staff, because there have been some staff losses as a result of uh, not necessarily people being infected, but folks having um, folks in a, in a compromised um, health uh, or potentially more vulnerable at home. And uh, so, uh, you know, some of our um, homeless service providers have lost staff because they need to stay home. Um, um, staff that would normally be face-to-face uh, -face with, uh, uh, with, with uh, guests in, in, in shelter. Um, and they've, they're also, uh, I think, going to increasingly be experiencing some level of staff burnout because it has been very, a very intense time for uh, homeless shelter staff and, and homeless provider staff and, um, and the entire anti-poverty network, uh, which would include the CAP agencies, which are also a, a critical part of this. Uh, just as an example, CDOEO here uh, based in, in Burlington, St. Albans and, and Middlebury is uh, working on standing up the uh, Congregate Recovery Center for, uh, for, for Chittenden County. Um, which is, you know, one of the facilities that um, that Ken uh, mentioned. I believe there's um, probably, I think, four or five of those are being stood up uh, around the state, um, separate and apart from um, the isolation centers uh, like 
Harbor Place uh, down on Shelburne Road, which uh, Champlain Housing Trust um, has, uh, you know, basically they took all the guests at Harbor Place um, and moved them into motels in order to create room for isolation housing at Harbor Place uh, for folks who are, uh, who may be showing symptoms uh, or uh, uh, have been tested, but the test results haven't, haven't come back yet. Um, so these 1,400 folks that are in motels, many of them uh, are, are being supported by uh, provision of food uh, and supportive services uh, by uh, the, the service providers around the state. Um, um, so that, that, as you can well imagine, is incredibly challenging. Uh, and our housing providers are incredibly challenged as well because uh, collectively they are housing some of the lowest income um, most vulnerable um, folks in uh, in the state, whether it's public housing authorities or uh, nonprofits uh, like uh, Cathedral Square Corporation, which focuses on uh, folks with disabilities and, and elders, uh, Champlain Housing Trust, Rural Edge in the Northeast Kingdom. And these they're all um, supporting uh, in place um, folks in in the affordable housing um, units that are now sheltering in place and so uh you know there may be emergency repairs uh, that are that are necessary and folks are having to go into uh people's homes um to to deal with emergency repairs there's folks who are uh shut in that need uh that that need a uh, variety of social supports uh especially in the elder housing um and and also uh food deliveries um, another uh, concern that has been voiced and uh, has, at least to a certain extent, uh, found some resolution is um, the issue of HIPAA confidentiality, um, and that when someone in a congregate uh, uh, congregate situation um, actually does contract the virus, HIPAA confidentiality basically prevents uh, anyone from knowing that unless that individual uh, volunteers it with uh, their prop their property manager, and uh, we do have hundreds of units of uh, congregate housing still around the state, SROs, uh, single room occupancy facilities, um, where people have uh, shared bathrooms and shared kitchens, and um, the the uh, potential for um, folks to um, to become infected in those situations, and then for that to spread throughout uh, the uh, individual uh, facility or are, are high, uh, perhaps not as high as uh, as in a, a nursing home, but but uh, certainly very uh, or as high as in a residential care level three or four residential care facility, um, but still uh, quite high. And these are uh, uh, homes where um, you know folks have individual rooms and then uh, a shared bathroom or, uh, or or shared kitchen facility. So the uh, potential for spread in those situations is 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 relatively high. Another concern um, that our folks are seeing is you know with uh, the state say stay home uh, order and um, all uh, you know non-essential folks uh, to work from home or or not work at all uh, depending on their work situation we've had a, a construction stop uh, all across the state so uh, all of our housing developments and I think Allison uh, Senator Clark uh, Clarkson pointed this out earlier there you know there are projects that are uh, underway or projects that are about that are shovel ready and about to go um, that have all been uh, all been stopped and, and that's uh, a serious issue um, for the nonprofits as well. And, and, and lastly, the other large concern um, that folks have had is uh, since uh, housers and um, homeless service providers all have close contact uh, with people, um, the issue of um, cleaning supplies and PPE has been an issue for uh, our, our network uh, of folks um, as well. Um, I've been focused a lot on the issue of, you know, what is the potential um, for the federal government to um, you know, help with uh, things like these emergency expense uh, expenses coming from uh, the pandemic, as well as potential rent loss. And I will tell you, uh, I don't have a lot more information than, than Josh does. Um, uh, it, it's still unclear. Uh, it's still unclear exactly how um, how the funds, um, some of the funds will flow and to what extent uh, they will uh, be able to support low-income renters. Uh, we do know that um, and I, um, this is uh, perhaps a little different from what you heard from Josh, that CDBG funds, uh, there is a provision in CDBG funds that allows them uh, to be used for up to three, three months, sorry for the barking dog in the background, up to three months um, for short-term rental assistance. And there is a waiver uh, that came with the CARES Act. Um, uh, normally there's a 15% um, uh, ceiling on uh, the public service uh, category of uh, CDBG expenditures that has been waived. Uh, and so CDBG is, uh, at least as I understand it from uh, some of our, our national folks that have been looking into this, uh, is 
uh, can be on a short-term basis, up to three months, uh, used for some form of uh, rental assistance. Um, emergency shelter grants uh, as well, um, I believe, can, uh, can be used for that. Um, I'll, I'll leave section eight uh, to Richard, but I will quickly uh, point out um, that we have uh, quite a large number of affordable housing units in the state that don't have any form of rental assist tenants with rental assistance uh, in them. And so that is a major gap in uh, the COVID-3 uh, bill from the feds. These are federally uh, federal low income housing tax credit subsidized units that don't have rental assistance in them. Um, the other major gap in COVID-3 is there was no money for USDA rural development uh, funded projects. And there's um, substantial about 12 or 1300 uh, rental assistance vouchers in that system statewide um, that don't have any additional uh, funding to increase people's subsidies. And um, there are also uh, what are known as um, USDA rural development 515 projects that don't have uh, rental assistance and similar to the federal low income housing tax credit properties without rental assistance. Uh, those also don't have the wherewithal um, to make up um, for uh, lost rent as a, as a result of uh, job, uh, job losses or, or work, hour, uh, work hour cutbacks. So there are gaps. Um, and I'll also just quickly say we're also beginning to work with uh, just all of our partners in state as well as our regional partners in the New, New England Housing Network and our national <laughs> association uh, starting to focus on uh, what might be needed in a potential COVID-4 uh, COVID-4 bill uh, to fill some of these gaps and then also looking forward to the notion that COVID-3 may have been an emergency relief bill uh, and COVID-4 will hopefully be more of a stimulus uh, bill uh, much the way ARA was uh, you know back in 08 and 09 uh, and that that could help uh, get the economy back up and running um, as we know housing is infrastructure and housing jobs pay well um, in, in construction and uh, during the recession that was uh, the housing money uh, for affordable housing was one of the ways that uh, contractors kept their people busy uh, and yep. that is one way to start the economy back up again so i'll stop there and um, um, want to leave time for the other witnesses and, and any questions that you might have Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, I guess I'm not understanding uh, the lack of money that in the, the various areas you talked about of, of public public housing and Richard probably will get into this a little bit more. Um, so if a tenant in one of these places, uh, aren't they covered by not having to pay more than 30% of their income? towards rent? If, yes, if they have rental assistance, and that is, you know, in the uh, COVID-3 bill, uh, the money that's going to public housing authorities, the money money that's going to tenant-based um, rental assistance, and the money that's going to project-based rental assistance um, will do that, but there is going to be a gap um, because not all affordable housing uh, um, apartments, uh, rental apartments, have that uh, type of assistance. So there will be a gap. Um, I don't have that exact number. Um, we do know that there's approximately uh, roughly 13,000 uh, um, uh, households in the state uh, that do have some form of uh, rental assistance, whether it's tenant-based or, or project-based or through, uh, through a housing authority. 13,000? Approximately, yes. So how many don't in that cohort that you're talking about, Earhart? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that, Senator. Do we have an idea of how many um, people are in um, affordable housing units that don't have that kind of assistance? Yeah, that that's that. So um, I will defer to uh, others. I know that the Housing Finance Agency and V and uh, Housing Vermont and um, VHCB are working. Um, more directly with some of our uh, housing providers. Our, our housing providers individually are going through their portfolios and identifying how many of uh, their uh, how many of their affordable um, apartments have folks in them that have that are supported by one of those rental subsidies. And so that's a number that we're still uh, we're still working uh, working on getting. It's not a number that's easily identifiable, um, you know, quickly identifiable 
um, on, on a statewide basis without uh, kind of getting reports back from each of our uh, regional nonprofits uh, and public housing authorities that um, operate affordable, uh, affordable housing. Uh, it's because of the different types of subsidies, um, some of which are capital subsidies only upfront. Uh, and then others that are on uh, that are ongoing, and, and so parsing that out um, is uh, it, it takes takes a little bit of a uh, little bit of work. Uh, but I, I I can say that um, the number that I just gave you, thirteen thousand, is my sort of back of the envelope calculation using. Um, um, the Housing Finance Agency has uh, the Directory of Affordable Rental Housing uh, online uh, at housingdata.org. It's uh, something that VHFA does for the housing community and keeps up to date. So when you, you look at those numbers there, you can kind of back into there's, uh, you know, there's so and so many tenant based Section 8 vouchers in the state and there's so and so many project based subsidies. Uh, when you add those all up, uh, you come up with about 13,000 um, of those. And the reason it's hard to parse out is because we have uh, approximately 5,500 tenant based subsidies in the state. Uh, some of those are in private sector for profit rental housing like um, the folks in Angela's Association, and some of those are in affordable housing that's owned by our, our nonprofits that may have right. been otherwise subsidized. So it's hard to parse parse out uh, to parse that out, and, and uh, we're, I, we're working I, on that. I was just I was just asking a, um, a basic question. I may not understand it, but I thought all affordable housing projects or units, by definition, had uh, were not able to charge more than 30 percent of a person's income um it depends um if they have a rental subsidy if the tenant has a tenant-based rental subsidy a section 8 subsidy uh, then that is true if the unit has attached to it what's known as a project-based rental assistance subsidy then that is also true um, but if it uh, if the unit of affordable housing and it could have been funded uh, you know, by the eight or nine or 10 different sources that developers uh, need to draw from federal low income housing tax credit, VHCB, CDBG, et cetera. If it just has those capital sources and no rental subsidy, then uh, that is, uh, then, then there is not that kind of adjustment to 30%. Uh, 30%. Uh, those units need to be affordable to people at certain income uh, ranges, lower income uh, ranges, um, based on the 30% standard. Uh, but they are not what I, uh, borrowing from another sector, uh, they're not what I would call income sensitized. So if somebody's income goes down in those units, the rent does not necessarily go down because there's no, no operating subsidy that's attached to the unit. Good, thank you. So uh, Erhard, uh, uh, just as we're all trying to uh, understand this more fully, are you, are you saying that the 5,500 tenant-based rental subsidies plus the project-based subsidy group, they get direct uh, money from HUD to pay rent? So the, well, in some ways, those landlords are at least getting some income. Is that what I'm understanding? Well, yes, and Richard can describe this process, but if, uh, if someone that has that form of subsidy, subsidy uh, loses their job and you know, their income goes down, uh, they go through a, uh, an, a recertification or an interim review process, um, which the housing authority has to you know, look at their, their new income. This is true if their income goes up as well. Uh, and so the subsidy is adjusted up or down depending on the, the change in the, in the income. And, and of course, you know, during the pandemic and with social distancing, all of this becomes very difficult. And, you know, uh, there's HUD guidance coming out on a day-to-day -day basis uh, about how you, you know, how you do this, how you do signatures on, you know, uh, forms that, that uh, testify to what somebody's income is and how you do income certification. It, it's, it's all made far more complicated by the pandemic and social distancing. Thanks. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions for Earhart? If I, I uh, oops, sorry. Okay. We're going to move on to. Uh, if if I could just say two things um, before uh, before I pass the the baton. One is uh, I just wanted to point out uh, there is a study, and I'll, I'll um, uh, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal that someone just forwarded to me uh, last night. 
um, that shows that preliminary uh, reports are that close to one third of renters um, either were unable to uh, or did not pay rent during the month of April. And I'll forward that. It was just a, a stunning number. Um, and I, 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 it's, it, it, it just scares me in terms of what uh, what what might be out there in terms of the the repercussions of the of the pandemic. And the other thing I'll say is that we really also as much as we're dealing with the emergency and the crisis, we do need to start looking forward, uh, as Josh said, to um, using this as an opportunity and using the um, the federal funds and whatever state funds are made available uh, to uh, house people in permanent support of housing. So all these folks that are in motels uh, can either be housed in the community the way Pathways Vermont does through their Housing First program or um, through uh, things like some of the micro uh, units that our nonprofits have stood up off as permanent affordable housing. And I, I, I do want to not be totally focused on the emergency, make sure that we start thinking forward uh, in that way as well. But thank you for the time. Thank you. Michael? Sorry, sorry, I was on mute. Richard, good morning, how are you? Good morning. Uh, good morning Hi, Richard. Senators. Good morning, Allison. Thank you. Uh, uh, for the record, I'm Richard Williams. I'm the Executive Director of Vermont State Housing Authority. Uh, and thank you to all of you folks uh, for what you do out there and this very important bill that you're working on here. Uh, I'm probably not going to be able to answer a lot of your questions today because uh, HUD uh, is typically lagging on getting us information and they've been promising for the last two weeks that they're going to give us a, a notice uh, that would explain specifically what waivers uh, we're granted to operate uh, our rental assistance programs under and uh, and we've also been waiting to see how much additional money may be available to us. It, uh, it probably won't be a process of actually saying that we get a certain amount, but what it does would allow us to do is to go through a sort of a recovery process uh, at the end of the year to draw down funds from, from, the, uh, from HUD specifically for the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. The good thing, uh, I passed something along to, uh, uh, to Senator Sorotkin over the weekend was that, and uh, I think that was also touched upon a little bit uh, uh, by David earlier, is that the uh, HUD does have a temporary eviction moratorium, uh, even if uh, forbearance is not requested or granted uh, for a 120 day period beginning on the date of the enactment of the CARES Act, which was March 27th, any owner of federally impacted property, property as well as property subject to the Belch, uh, Violence Against Women Act or Rural Housing Voucher Programs may right. not initi initiate a legal action uh, to recover possession of the covered dwelling from the tenant for non-payment of rent or and may not charge any other fees uh, or other charges. Uh, they can't charge uh, fees or penalties uh, related to non-payment of the rent. After the 120 day period expires, the owner of the federally impacted property may then issue a notice to vacate to a tenant, but may not require the tenant to vacate that covered dwelling uh, before the date is 30 days after the date on which the late lessor provides the tenant with such notice to vacate. So an owner can send reminder notices to continue to pay rent, but they can't threaten or terminate a lease or a voucher, uh, and they can't charge any additional fees. My understanding is that uh, owners could still terminate for health, safety, drug, or criminal activity. So that's the one thing we do know. Uh, the other thing is that anybody that's participating, any uh, landlord that's participating in the program uh, that's receiving rental assistance will continue to receive that. Uh, HUD is advancing money, uh, not only to my agency, but to other public housing authorities uh, and just a reminder, there's eight other local uh, housing authorities in the state of Vermont that either operate uh, public housing or operate a Section 8 Housing Choice uh, Voucher Program. So we're also, Vermont State Housing Authority is also contract administrator, contract administrator for uh, these project-based subsidies that Earhart re referenced. Those payments are going out uh, as well. 
And, and as we understand this, uh, as part of the CARES Act and part of, uh, 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 in relationship to, to HUD, is that they're putting uh, uh, additional money in there in anticipation that people are, are losing income and will require, as Earhart said, an interim re-exam of income. Therefore, their portion of the rent that the, the tenant would pay goes down, but the housing assistance payment that the federal government pays to the, directly to the landlord will go up. So I've got a lot of questions out there because I was hoping that maybe we could use some of that money. Uh, so if, if tenants you know, fell behind in their rent, could we just increase the housing assistance payment up to 100% to make the landlord whole. Uh, I was on a phone call yesterday with the Boston Regional Office. Unfortunately, they can't answer that question. Uh, I've also asked to see if there's any way, I've been told there's no new monies in that bill in the CARES Act that would, that would allow us uh, to issue uh, for new vouchers. But there is possibly a mechanism where we still may be able to increase our baseline by some of the monies that may be coming directly to us so that we may be able to offer additional vouchers. Uh, but as I think a lot of folks have already uh, might have mentioned, as it's a real challenge to do lease-ups right now. And we are continuing to operate and we are doing lease-ups. Uh, and we've obviously had to set a lot of protocols, uh, you know, for the safety, not only of the resident, but safety of our of our staff as well and so we're doing lease ups on uh, empty units um, and sometimes that's being done remotely uh, or or through video uh, but we're looking for a lot of waivers that will allow us to some other options uh, so i think you know at least for people that have a, a voucher or in a project that has a subsidy attached to it they're in a pretty good situation as far as being protected. If they, if they report that they've had a loss in income to us, you know, we can do a retroactive decrease in their payment of rent, increase so, the landlord payment. Richard, may I just ask a question of the uh, number of people that Earhart had identified of the 13,000 uh, people who receive uh, rental assistance or are in affordable, units how many does that do those two groups of people how many of the of the 13,000 does that represent that where you say that the rent is going out to the landlords uh, and so of that 13,000 I think we have about 8,000 of them okay and so I know for so for about 8,000 I know that they're getting paid that's great it, the, this, what so are the, uh, a portion, right? Because the renter is responsible for some of it. So they're getting roughly, you know, 75 to 80% of, of what their rent would be is paid by, uh, paid through the housing assistance payment from the federal government. Right. So. Thank you. But, Senator, just to be better. clear, that 13,000 was all uh, folks in the, situ in the situation Richard's describing. All those 13,000 have some form of rental assistance. So Richard, I, I, I understand the uh, assistance for the income-based uh, programs. Um, how do, in the project-based program, how does that rent get paid? Is it split in any way by the tenant uh, and, the, and the, uh, the housing authority? Good question. Uh, Yes, if it has project-based vouchers or project-based uh, assistance uh, assigned to the unit, uh, same process works. Uh, the tenant would pay a, a, a portion based on their income. Like 25 the be paid. or 30? Well, it's typically, you know, 30%. It could be as high as 40% of their income. Some of the other types of uh, housing that Earhart referred to is like 
uh, I hate to get into acronyms, but USDA uh, Rural Development Program uh, offers rental assistance, and they also have, uh, if they are not providing rental assistance, they have what they call a basic rent or market rent. It's usually below uh, what the market would be, uh, and it's typically affordable for someone. It's you know, it's it's uh, it's based on uh, affordability, but there's no so they're they're paying a higher so they usually in a higher income situation so they're paying a, a higher rent to be able to live there without a subsidy so so richard um when you said that the that hud was being slow about lagging behind on 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 money and it's unclear what vermont is going to get i see two areas that affect uh uh the your area, the tenant-based rental assistance and the project-based rental assistance. And that's 1.25 for the former and a billion uh, for project. You don't yet have a notion of how much project-based rental assistance you'll get. No, unfortunately, I do not at this time. Amazing. We're being told by, fr we're being told by uh, this Friday that we'll have additional information. Uh, so we're, we're waiting here. Uh, for more, what so, we understand, well, we understand there'd be a lot of waivers granted to us uh, uh, to do uh, to do business differently than we have, and to hopefully be able to delay uh, delay something that's a lot of the requirements that's uh, under the under the program. So, uh, may I just ask uh, a follow up question, which is. Once you have clarity on the money and what you can use it for, would you also be addressing the mobile home uh, lot rent uh, help in any way? Well, the only way that would uh, apply is if someone's living in a mobile home park and it has a, you know, a Section 8 uh, housing choice voucher. Uh, that would, could help those folks uh, with their lot rent. It could increase their lot rents. But for all the folks that, and that's a good point that you brought up, Senator, is that uh, uh, for the for many of the mobile home parks in Vermont, they're owned by nonprofits or their other or their co-ops, um, you know. So they're going to also need some some uh, relief if there is a some type of a stimulus package here uh, in Vermont to help help the owners, those park owners, because uh, we typically will notice. Uh, in a park, uh, they're more, definitely more income sensitive. So, you know, as they're strained, you know, if, for loss of income or whatever, uh, those lot rents uh, start to appear delinquent uh, sooner. We've already started to see that happen uh, just in a uh, short period of time that we've been operating under this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. So, so we anticipate, so we, what basically what I'm saying is we anticipate the delinquencies will go up in the mobile home parks. And, and, and when are we going to get a notion? I mean, because obviously this is something we're pretty concerned with, along with the rest of you. Uh, when do you think we might have a notion of how we can either help or how much money will be there to help or what we can do legislatively to help? Uh, I think that we will start to see, uh, uh, start to see those delinquencies show up, and I think we'd be able to offer some uh, some suggestions to uh, uh, to the legislature. I, also, I see Angela's on 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 this as well, and she represents a lot of the private uh, mobile home parks, and she could speak for those folks. Uh, but it would be pretty easy to. Uh, I know VHCB is in constant contact with uh, with the nonprofit sector that owns the parks, uh, and. There's uh, uh, several parks, as you know, are, are cooperatively owned here in Vermont, uh, and it's easy to reach out to them to find out what the impact is uh, would be to the co-ops as well. But I guess I, the point I was just trying to make is just, you know, they're landlords too, uh, just yeah. like the private landlords. And uh, so they just need to be part of, part of that package as well. Uh, they, they will be also looking for some relief.
Okay. Anything else you'd like to add, Richard? Uh, no, the only thing I noticed was that, uh, <clears throat> you know, as the, uh, the whole emergency uh, uh, process in Vermont, you know, I know there's a, lots of people, people are on that, uh, on that, you know, the operations committee for, for emergency management. But the, the one thing that I think we need to work on in the future is get, getting some housing providers on that as well. Uh, there's a lot of data that's coming out of that that uh, would be very helpful for housing providers to be seeing. You know, one of, the, one of the challenges we've had, and it's been talked about a little bit, is just the communication between, uh, between Dale and Department of Health. Uh, you know, people are struggling trying to determine, you know, if, if there's someone in their properties that, uh, you know, have the virus. Uh, and with all the HIPAA rules and regulations, uh, we're unable to really sometimes protect our people because we're not aware of it. We were relying on a tenant uh, to tell us if, if, you know, if they are sick. And then, you know, we, you know, there's more advanced protocols that we go in with, you know, fogging the, uh, the building or whatever, and, you know, trying to kill the virus. Uh, but that's only as good as one touch away. Uh, so you constantly have to be doing it, but we've had quite a few scares. Uh, you know, we've been told that people have had, you know, uh, that uh, have contracted this disease. And uh, so, uh, but there's no way to really, uh, to confirm it. And so uh, we've had that in three or four of our elderly housing projects around the state. And, you know, uh, people, is you know. Anything, is there anything you could, you could see the legislature doing quickly in that regard, uh, oh. that may be a you know one-on-one -on -one educational kind of approach that's necessary. Well, I think that uh, we're we're seeing uh, you know we're seeing actually uh, them reaching out to us now because I think uh, originally they were focused on the long-term care facilities and nursing homes and such and. And now I think you're realizing that, you know, there's a lots of elderly housing projects, certainly in Chittenden County, you're aware of them, Senator, there's many very large senior housing projects. Like uh, Pinecrest. Yeah, that, but you know, like uh, the uh, Decker Towers, you know, uh, Burlington Housing Authority has, and Winooski Housing Authority has some huge high rises, 12, 14 stories that are senior housing. And same thing is if the virus gets into a, you know, into an elderly housing project like that, it will go through there like a wildfire. Right. And uh, so that's they're all housing authorities and directors. I've been hearing it because we are on, we have uh, weekly meetings and that is a big concern is that just there's lack of communication um, and protocols. So, well, I, I, I'm no expert in HIPAA, um, not an expert in senior housing, but um, could there be like a, a visiting nurse that comes to the building and sits in the lobby or something and offers their services to talk to people uh, to try and get this information voluntarily? I think a lot of those providers are not going into the facilities any longer, you know, and so the services that a lot of the seniors were getting are now on hold. I believe the SASH, you know, uh, coordinators or, or whatever are being restricted on what they can do. So so many of these residents were receiving uh, services that are really no longer getting those services. So it, it, it you know, compounds uh, challenges. It's not a bad idea. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm coming at it from a totally lay perspective, but it, it would strike me if, if there's a real risk there, is somebody thinking about offering testing services in these congregate housing for obviously for free, but make it really easy for the tenants to get tested. Hopefully as these, uh, the testing becomes more available and uh, easier to be, uh, to be done, uh, that we'll see that in the future, but it, it really doesn't exist now that I can see. Uh, the only time it happens is when some is, someone's ill or, you know, you read about, you know, some of the, you know, the situations that's happened up in Chittenden County, that's when they do the contract, uh, contact uh, tracing, you know, back. And that's when 
people learn that there's an issue in their building if they already weren't aware of it. A lot of times, a lot of these health providers work in different facilities. So, you know, that's, a, you know, I, I don't know what's being done to protect those folks, but, you know, going from one facility to another, you know, there's always, always some dangers that the virus travels with them. Okay. I just wanted to bring it to your attention that it's, it just has been a real challenge. Uh, just not, not getting good information, not knowing. Um, and I understand, I mean, nobody's been through this, you know, ever. So uh, I, mean, I, I, I hone in on this as I'm sure the rest of my committee does. I mean, a lot of the other stuff, you know, a lot of it can be done hopefully on the back end with money, but pre preventing the spreading of the disease can't wait to the back end um exactly so i just uh well i think if there's anything that this committee can do or is to put any pressure on other departments uh, within the agency of human services to you know to have better uh, communication to housing providers uh, and working with housing providers uh, to stop the spread of this uh, would be very helpful would you would you be willing to write us a short letter not only assessing the potential for this problem, what you've seen thus far, and some ideas, however far-fetched or expensive you think they may be or whatever problems, impediments there, if you could get, get us a sort of a, a, a one-page letter on that, I think that would be helpful for us to run with it a little bit. Okay, great. Yeah, I, good, I, good I'm sorry, go ahead. No, good idea. Yeah, I'm gonna just... Uh, I'm just going to reach out to some of the other uh, uh, housing directors as well, public housing directors, because uh, you know uh, they uh, they many of these like Rutland, for example, and 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 other areas of the state have very large early housing projects. So I will draw upon their uh, uh, them as a resource as well. And Michael, I'm thinking that you know testing may be ideal, but and short of testing, even just monitoring, um, you know, taking temperatures in places like this. I don't know how that would work, but yes. um, that might be a way of at least keeping an eye on what's happening uh, in those facilities. I was interested in one of the comments that uh, Kenan made about, uh, I think you asked him uh, the question about uh, testing uh, some of the homeless population um, and they said they were relying on the uh, homeless to contact their uh, medical provider and I'm yeah. thinking that most of, the, most of these folks don't have access to that unless okay. they go to an emergency room or you know walk in but I would think that most of them don't have a actual housing uh, medical provider you know okay thank you richard very much yeah. uh thank you very much is maura with us this morning yep i'm here good morning maura how are you good morning i'm so cooped up that i'm so excited to be here with you all and that should tell you something about how i'm doing is that your <laughs> office or is that your house this is my home this i am in a basement bunker office Okay. Praying to God that you don't hear my three small children running around okay. us. Good. Yes, and, Good. and now you've become a teacher, too. Yes. No, I want to give full credit. I have a stay-at-home husband who has taken the lead on being a teacher. So that's how this is possible. That's Good. fabulous. Good. Can I jump in? Yes, absolutely jump in. Okay. My name is Maura Collins. I'm the director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Um, uh, I did testify on um, part of this bill on the when it was in the House, um, really uh, in support, but also putting out a word of hoping everyone, the administration, the legislature, when you're talking with your constituents to um, be careful about your messaging of the moratorium, um, as we've been talking about the moratorium on both foreclosures and evictions um, that we've seen from the federal government don't come with money directly. 
Now, later, the CARES Act came with some money, and we've been talking about where that money will work and where it may not. But um, it's really important when you're talking with your constituents to encourage, especially homeowners, to contact their mortgage servicer about what they're eligible for. It gets very complicated very quickly, and there is no one pager that anyone is going to be able to give to you or your constituents about what to do. So the rule of thumb is everyone with a mortgage who is wondering about what to do should contact their servicer. It's just like telling a renter to contact their landlord if um, they're having trouble paying their rent or um, need their income adjusted if they're in some kind of government program or something. But um, it can be hard to contact servicers right now. I know VHFA's uh, main servicer, their call volume is up 300%. So I'm not saying people won't be frustrated uh, by trying to get through, but um, if people are gonna be eligible for forbearance, deferrals, anything, they have to start by contacting their servicer. They cannot just not pay their mortgage or their rent. They need to have a conversation. Um, and I agree with Josh, he pointed out that there is gonna be a need for money to help people pay their rent and mortgage. Um, these forbearance and deferrals really help for the people who are out of work temporarily and then will be able to jump back into work whenever the governor lifts this order and life may return to normal for them. But I think we all are expecting that life probably isn't going to return to normal for quite some time and that the economy is not just going is not a light switch you can flip on and so um 71 percent of vermonters are homeowners and right now there are no programs identified to help them pay their mortgage so again if a deferral or forbearance so that they can skip a couple payments and those payments get lobbed on to the end of their loan may really make a difference for people and um and so it's a good thing but do know that unlike through the cares act for renters there is no money coming to help those 71 percent of vermonters actually pay the three or four months of mortgage payments that um get built up at some point we are vhfa is monitoring you were wondering about economic impact we're monitoring 16 construction sites across the state of affordable housing developments and all of the activities with the exception of a few essential activities have stopped um, the monthly impact to those projects just in financing costs can be as high as ten thousand dollars a month so that's how much they're just paying on interest for one single project. And there's 16 of those all at different um, sizes. So we don't know about the future cost and price increases because of this delay. Um, it's, there's bigger concerns about the construction industry's ability to simply reboot on the other side of this. And um, the labor we talked about with subcontractors and the flow of construction material chains, these are all things we're concerned about. But VHFA alone is one of many construction lenders in the state has about $30.5 million in approved construction loans uh, right now. And only about $7.5 million of that money has been drawn on. So I say that because there's $23 million worth of economic activity waiting for the economy to open up again. And as has been talked about, that affordable housing can be a real asset in this way um, to get the economy jump started. We saw it in the last recession. It was the affordable housing that um, kept the construction industry going. And it can be again now. So that's why it was so important to VHFA to have our tax credit award meeting a few weeks ago and to um, make sure that we are doing whatever we can so that affordable housing keeps moving forward and, and helps the economy as well as the ultimate residents of that housing. Um, now, our focus, VHFA's focus, is on affordable housing properties. Um, but Josh spoke to the affordable housing needs overall, and they're going to go well beyond that. 
he talked about private landlords, you know, we always refer to as mom and pop landlords. Um, these RV people, I frankly hadn't even thought about that, but he brought up a good point about um, that. Richard talked about the mobile home parks, tri park, you've heard a lot about. There's tremendous need out there. Um, not to mention the massive motel usage that Commissioner Schatz was talking about. Um, and what we're going to do when uh, the hotels and motels housing AHS clients right now are not just the ones they're used to working with, but to house 1,400 people, they've needed to reach into hotels who don't traditionally house this population, even on cold weather nights. And therefore, once they can start housing tourists again, um, there's going to be a quick push to um, move people. And I'll say from BHFA's perspective, we would love to be a part of a solution that move those people into independent housing and not back into congregate settings like shelters because this public health emergency is not gonna be over when the governor lifts the stay at home order. We may be able to resume some level of normalcy, but I do not, what I'm reading is that it will not be safe for people to live in congregate settings for at least the next year, if not longer, until there's more of a vaccine to address this. So do I support part of the $1.25 billion that the state's gonna get from the feds to go to housing? Absolutely. Housing is critical. It's how we got through the last recession. It is a great way to help individuals. And, but you're right that people will be clamoring for it. I'm not naive and to think that um, it's going to be easy to earmark a part of that. Um, but we are working hard to be a part of the solution. And so I'll tell you a few things we've done without needing you all to tell us to do it, but just because we're good state partners. And then I'm going to finish by telling you, um, Senator Sorok, in your question, you've asked everyone about what can the legislature do. I have a couple ideas for you. Um, VHFA, you've heard me testify in the past about how we're a, um, the administrator of the tax credit program, the federal program, that is the largest source of money uh, that goes into um, the affordable housing creation. And so we've relaxed as many of the regulatory rules as possible with that because the governor um, requested and received uh, the federal uh, declaration, I'm blanking on the term, emergency declaration, and now we're a FEMA site and all that as of this week, we can relax more tax credit rules. And so uh, we are working to identify any vacant apartments and trying to pair that up with being a part of the housing solution for AHS. And it used to be, or it would normally be that you have to abide by tax credit eligibility rules to live in tax credit housing. But those rules are now um, going to be waived even more than they were before we had that emergency declaration. So um, we're working with our partners on that. VHFA uh, owns, some um, mortgages. And so we are following the federal example of um, doing a foreclosure moratorium, just like you've heard Freddie and Fannie doing. There are some VHFA loans that don't fall under those Freddie and Fannie rules. And we are doing the same kind of um, offering of forbearance and deferrals and, and absolutely an eviction or um, a moratorium on any new foreclosure actions but also on existing foreclosures. You know, there are people who well before COVID, we were in the foreclosure process with, and we have suspended moving forward on that because we will not be a reason that a household becomes homeless during a public health emergency. Um, we have, Earhart referenced that um, we've surveyed affordable housing properties to find out the impact of uh, April, and we've asked them to, um, project forward May and June's rent projections and what they expect to see as a loss of rent. Um, we think we're a good partner to do this. We've done it in partnership with VHCB and the state um, and big housing providers like Housing Vermont. And um, But we're asking everyone what is happening in April and what they're going to need in terms of potential loan forbearance or deferrals on our multifamily loans. And we think we're a good partner to do that because 
we do have loans not only on all the nonprofit affordable housing, but also for profit affordable housing. Um, and so we're looking at that on a cost by cost basis. And in, I would think another week or two weeks, we could give you some um, early estimates of what we're seeing across the board on the affordable housing um, properties and what um, what they've gotten or not gotten in terms of rent collections. I know it, um, it might be frustrating for you to not have those numbers now, but it is typical to give uh, tenants a 10 day grace period and paying their rent. And so it's important to us that we um, make sure that we're really telling you who didn't pay their rent and the impact on the properties um, while not, um, well, and, and that's hard to do before we get past the 10th of the month. So our plan is to look at that on a case by case basis with projects. You know, affordable housing properties are financially structured to carry conservative operating and replacement reserves. So the affordable housing system is really strong in that way. And we're asking properties to look to those reserves before anything happens. Um, we will be looking at restructuring loans um, or seeing if any projects can take on any new loans to help them float through this time period. The problem is, is that it's not just people not paying their rent, but as you know, there's added expenses that we've been talking about um, that are unforeseen. Cleaning expenses, higher than usual staffing expenses and other things that will really put pressure on these projects. And so at the end of the day, if a, if a deferral on a um, multifamily loan needs to happen, we can do that. But at some point, more lending is not going to um, solve all our problems. VHFA is looking to move out of our typical way of doing things. And we're creating a 0% loan pool that will be available for two years to projects so that if deferred payments, um, if after two years they still can't, or I'm sorry, not two years, if a few deferred payments cannot um, be enough to get a property um, uh, functioning financially, then VHFA will be able to offer a small amount of 0% money for two years to projects. The problem is, is that we don't have a lot of money for that. Right now we're looking at $1.5 million, um, which will be helpful, but it's not a huge amount. And uh, without going into the details of it all, VHFA does not really have the ability to take big losses on that. We are, that was money VHFA had for other reasons that we are able to free up for two years and not earn any money on it. But um, we will need that money let's say in year three. So we can't take losses there. And so um, for the state to consider potentially um, backfilling any losses that we have on that $1.5 million, should that come to be? And um, if there was a way the state could help us grow from a $1.5 million pool to something larger, I would love to see that. That's how much money VHFA has identified at this point to do that. Another, I have three things. That's one. So a loan loss provision. You've done it with VITA. VITA is much, um, I'll say economic development loans in general are riskier types of loans. And so you have created loan loss reserves for economic development loans in the past. We don't typically ask for that because like I said, the affordable housing system is strong and we aren't used to having loan losses in this area, but this may be the time that that changes. We'd also like some flexibility with the state tax credits. Uh, you've heard me talk about state tax credits in the past. Right now in statute, it says that there's $400,000 for rental credits and $425,000 for home ownership credits. And I'm ignoring the down payment assistance credits because don't worry about them. I'm asking if the legislature would consider for I'm gonna say the next two years, it would be FY21 and 22. Could we just pool that total of $825,000 of state credits and allow VHFA 
with our board to make the decision about if it's better used in a rental or home ownership um, capacity. And we are not asking for an increase in state tax credits, just the flexibility that, I don't know, what if the rental housing developments are able to come out of this um, lockdown quicker and easier, and maybe there's more demand on the rental side than the home ownership side, uh, allow us to look at the applications and be flexible there um, and not have there be a resource that potentially could go underutilized if there wasn't demand on either the rental or the home ownership side. So that would be, again, not, not new money, but would be a flexibility of existing money. And the last thing is just a plug, as much as I know there's gonna be a lot of pressure on that 1.25 billion for how um, available to the state, some of it does need to go to housing. It would be unconscionable for this state to maybe not 100% empty its homeless shelters, but get pretty darn close to reducing the number of people living in congregate settings only to move them back there while there still is a public health emergency going on for the next year. And we're gonna recreate, redo this cycle. We, it is important that we keep these people as safe as the rest of us, who it looks like most of us are safe in our homes right now. These vulnerable Vermonters deserve the same. And so I know I've been talking with Gus and with Josh and uh, Sarah Phillips at AHS and Richard Williams, and we've all been talking about how can we all work together to make sure that not only are we don't move people from these hotels back into shelters, but also some folks in affordable housing who are living in congregate settings with shared bathrooms, how can we protect them and move people into independent housing that is going to keep them safe for the duration of this event. My, Michael, uh, thank you, Maura. Michael, are you there? Yes, he he's just Hi. muted. I'm, I'm here. Hi, Michael. Uh, I apologize, but it's 10 of 12 and um, I have a 12 o'clock meeting I'm chairing, uh, which I am gonna have to go to in about four or five minutes. Okay. So let me, I was going to- I, I apologize. Thank, thank you, Maura. Um, can you put those three ideas in writing? And one of the things I want to encourage all the witnesses to do is we're caught in between a rock and a hard place here and trying to come up with a comprehensive help, assistance, long range plan. And we, there's a lot of parts that are unknown to us and funding that's still not known, but we're also very concerned of knowing, is there anything we can do immediately that needs attention right now that waiting two months may lose us time? So when I hear about the checking in on people in congregate settings who may contract the disease or more likely to contract the disease, that jumps out at me. Some of the steps we might be able to take to avoid putting people back in shelters. I don't know whether there's things we can start putting in place now, as opposed to waiting till the end of May to start dealing. So think along those idea lines as well, because uh, I assume there's some things that may be more timely uh, than others. As far as your scheduling concern, you're right with you, Randy. Uh, I was hoping that we could go on till 1230 or maybe even a little longer if the members can do that. If we can't, then we're gonna, I can see one head shaking. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I have a 12 o'clock meeting. Sadly. I, know you, I, I know you, I know you can, but I have a 12 people. as well, Michael. Okay. I am sorry that these things take longer. So we're going to have to reschedule and it may be as early as tomorrow or maybe next week sometime, uh, but we'll get back with everybody. I don't wanna lose anybody from the committee because I have one issue that I just need to deal with right now. And I apologize to all the other people who have been waiting, I really do. Um, so on the bill tomorrow, on the eviction moratorium bill, there was a section you recall on notarization that we noted, we narrowed, and I think I sent an email. Out to people, yep. The House, the Senate has a has the larger version, and uh, the Judiciary Committee has the larger version 
on that that covers all notarizations. Um, and I'm proposing, I would like to put in an amendment to strike our section because it's gonna be taken care of by judiciary and to the extent the judiciary bill somehow stalls in the house, uh, they can always put our version back on uh, S-333. Uh, I'll put it in under my name, but unless there's any, I just wanted to make sure people were aware of that. And if there's any objection to that, uh, let me know now. Does everybody understand what the mm -hmm. issue is? Yeah. It, any problem yeah. with taking that section out of our bill? No, I just want to make sure the judiciary goes ahead. And if not, we can, the House well, I've, I've, written this. To, I've written to Senator Sears and Senator White. Yeah, I uh, saw yeah, and so uh, I assume I'll hear from them, if not. So I'll put it in the calendar, and if we need to revisit it tomorrow morning, we can uh, before we go on the floor. Does anybody know what time we're going on the floor tomorrow? 9.30. 9.30, okay. Okay. Uh, again, my sincere apologies. This is a, it's a lot of stuff to digest here, and I should have realized that other people have meetings at noon, so we couldn't extend this. Uh, and I'll be back in touch with folks uh, this afternoon. I'll see two of you in finance at 1.30. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Th Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. That was Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank yeah. you.